civil kang. An 18-year-old larger than life, Pacific Walrus, who loves his food. And a well-fed walrus is a happy walrus. By now, he should be a dad. But things haven't worked out. Which is where Holly Morocco comes in. Together, they have a very special relationship. An expert on animal reproduction, Sibukak is proving to be her toughest challenge to date. In zoos around the world, even pandas have been bred more successfully than walruses. So Polly is trying the near impossible. The secret of walrus love is a mystery. But perhaps the clues to success lie in exploring the lives of Sibukak's wild cousins. Could they hold the key to helping him have a family of his own? I think Sibukak is going to become a dad this year. He's ready, and we're definitely ready to have that little bundle of joy walrus. This is Uku. Her name means blubber. This is Siku, which is Eskimo for ice. This is Kiluk. Her name means bark. And this big guy right here, this is Sibuka which is the native Eskimo term for the village of Gamble, which is where we got these guys. It all began in 1994. All these young walruses are orphans, their mothers having been killed by hunters in the wild wastes of Alaska. They were brought to Six Flags Discovery Kingdom in California, where they were adopted by surrogate parents who cared for them as they grew up. If they'd not been rescued, they would have died young. Sivukak is now three and a half meters long and weighs 1,000 kilograms. He's the park's main attraction. past six years, he shared his life with scientist Polly Maraca. During that time, they forged quite a bond. Good boy. So, these walruses respond a lot to blowing in their nose, so to speak. All right, so goodbye. It's walrus etiquette here that you walk in, and it's rude if you don't say hello. So you blow in their nose, they know who you are, they get an idea of, uh, of what's going on, and then everything is okay. Sibukak shares his Californian home with the two female orphans who made it to adulthood. Oh. Okay. 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 Ukuk is the shy, modest, retiring one of the two. Siku has a cheeky, toothless grin. Her tusks were removed after an infection. Okay. She's much more blase and easygoing. Oh. Okay. The girls are very sharp. They're very smart animals. Even he's very smart. <laughs> yes, you are. But his brain tends to check out sometimes, uh, especially when he's hormonal and he's in rut. And he's a bit of a knucklehead. He's, he's not all there. He's getting ready to blow some snot. Walruses are truly remarkable animals. Their name is thought to come from a combination of whale and horse. 
There are Pacific and Atlantic walruses living in the Arctic seas around the North Pole. They belong to the same family as seals and sea lions. Both males and females have whiskers and tusks, which they use to drag themselves out of the water. They can weigh the same as a small family car. But we still know very little about how they live their lives. Sibukak is helping to change all that. After almost 20 years of scrutiny by US scientists, he is now the most studied walrus ever. But one thing in particular remains mysterious, their breeding behavior. Holly wants to change this and help Sibukak become a dad. She's working hard to make it happen. She's helped breed dolphins. Yeah. Elephants. Giraffes. And sea lions. But breeding walruses is proving to be a different kettle of fish. The reason why it's so important to be able to breed walruses in zoos is because every zoo is always striving to be self-sustaining so that we can have long-term populations. So understanding reproduction and being able to have babies in a zoo is very important. Male and female walruses have been housed together in U.S. zoos and parks for almost 80 years. Yet in all that time, there have been just 15 live births. Routine hormone tests indicate Siku may be pregnant. Today is the day she'll find out. Which way does she roll? Uh, she'll probably roll your way. A pregnancy would be a really big event for everyone. All right. Hold it. All right, Dessa. All right, let's see the what we The timing see. is now. Hold it. Good, Siku. Right now, it's not looking so good. Mm. And not seeing her uterus with much fluid at all. Well, that's disappointing. Yeah, that is. But, try again. We try again. You just need a baby in there. Unfortunately, we will not have any babies this spring. Neither Siku or Ukuk are currently pregnant. We had a lot of hopes that they were, but something wasn't quite right. And um, it's very disappointing, but unfortunately we are gonna have to go into another breeding season and try all over again. Holly has been trying to breed the walruses for the past six years. And this isn't the first time she's been disappointed. One year in particular stands out when she came to within a whisker of success. In 2010, Ukuk did get pregnant. About a week before she gave birth, the fetus died, and Ukuk ultimately delivered a stillborn. The only way to say it is Ukuk grieved. And for two days, she cared for the baby. She called to it, she held it, she nuzzled it, and it was absolutely devastating. It took her a long time before she finally came back around and her wonderful personality started coming out again. After so many years of failure, heartache and disappointment, Holly really needs a breakthrough. 
And perhaps the clues are not here in the lab, but further afield. With the wild walruses, back in Siwukak's native home in Alaska. Here comes Siwukak. But she can't leave without saying goodbye to her special walrus. Hey, buddy. How's it going? <laughs> we have very nosy walruses that love to see everything that we do. All right, Siwukak. I have to go to Alaska. I am going to go learn about wild walruses. I'm going to miss you, but the girls are going to feed you and feed you and feed you while I'm gone, and I will see you when I get back. Holly's heading in search of a haul out, a mass gathering of male walruses, which happens during the summer months on remote beaches. It's what Sibukak would be doing in the wild. Holly begins her journey with a 2,000-mile flight to Anchorage, Alaska. From there, she takes a second flight to Lake Clark before heading along the Alaskan Peninsula, which separates the Bering Sea from the North Pacific. As she heads further and further into the wilderness, the plains get ever smaller. and for good reason. She's heading to a walrus haulout at Cape Seniavi, a rugged, sea-sculptured beach on the Bering Sea coast. And there are no runways out here, so the plane must be small enough to land on a narrow stretch of beach. Holly's never traveled this far north before. She's studied her walruses for six years, but has never seen one in the wild. In recent years, this has become one of the most important haul-out areas in the whole of Alaska. Its remoteness allows them to gather here safely, and Holly must take care not to disturb them. So we're close enough to the walrus herd now to smell them. It's a pretty uh, intense smell. <laughs> They're not the cleanest animals. Um, we're still approaching extremely cautiously. We just can't be too careful. Um, there's just so little known about walruses. We have no idea how great their eyesight is or their sense of smell or hearing. But we do know that they're very spooky animals, and we have to be careful. So we're just approaching very slowly and cautiously. Um, but so far, they're just jostling among themselves and don't seem too concerned with our presence at this time. Carefully, making sure I don't disturb them. Oh my goodness. Absolutely amazing. There's about 150 to 200 sabukaks lying together on this beach. Look at all that bulk. Oh, these guys easily outweigh Samukak by at least a thousand pounds. Oh my goodness, look at the size of that guy. Amazing. Sabukak probably wouldn't make it very long out here, I'm guessing. He's a bit too much of a pretty boy. One thing that's so interesting about these male walruses is those large bumps that you see on these wild males all over their neck. And we don't see that on Sabukak. 
we sort of assume that they're formed when they hit one another with their, their tusks. But then there's another theory that suggests that it's just male walruses, as they reach maturity, develop them naturally. But then Savukok is a mature male and he doesn't have any. So that's another walrus mystery. A red fox makes a guest appearance. The long Arctic winter appears to have taken its toll, but the beach is a good place to scavenge for food. The walruses keep a close eye as the fox gets closer. Despite their size, they're nervous. They're off. The fox has sent these giants perhaps 300 times its own weight running for cover. Surely one of the natural world's greatest mismatches. Seemingly unaware of the chaos she's caused, the fox checks out a dried up walrus carcass, then leaves a calling card to let everyone know whose territory this really is. And exits stage left. With the walruses now all at sea, it's a good time to call it a day and head back to camp. Although late in the evening, there are still two hours of daylight left before the sun briefly dips below the horizon. It's easy to lose track of the time out here. This far north, summer lasts only three months, but the long days mean it's a time of great productivity. Plants photosynthesize all day and all night, and for a few short months, the tundra blooms. For some animals, it's a chance to rear their young. But for the walruses, it's the opposite. This is when they recharge their batteries, having barely eaten during the winter breeding season. Wild walruses feed by rooting along the sea bottom foraging on over 60 different kinds of marine creatures. Clams are their favorite, which they find with their sensitive whiskers, excavate with jets of water, then suck out the meat. Each one is devoured in just six seconds, and up to 6,000 in a day. It may look destructive, but walrus feeding helps keep the Arctic seas amongst the richest in the world. Disturbing the sediment releases nutrients which feed the fish. Their organic waste trickles back down to the seabed, feeding the clams and other creatures of the sea floor. This trickle down not only enriches life on the sea bottom, but ultimately provides more food for the walruses. During midsummer this far north, it's hard to know when night ends and day begins. But it does mean Holly can make the most of her time with the herd. At the hole out, she discovers more big males dragging themselves out onto the beach. As they emerge from the cold water, they're a ghostly white, having redirected blood from their skin to their hearts and other internal organs. As they warm, blood returns to the surface and they turn pink. Those that have been beached the longest 
return to their characteristic rich, ruddy brown. But right now, there's no aggression. All of these males are sort of in a big love-in right now. They're all very sort of happy to be together. As the season progresses and their testosterone starts to rise, this is going to change dramatically. That change won't happen until later in the year, when shorter days trigger a dramatic shift in male walrus behavior and they enter the rut, the peak of their sexual activity. Right now in midsummer, these walruses could not be more different from Sibukak. One thing that's really clear is Sibukak is really out of sync. Right now, these males are not displaying any type of rut behavior. It's a bachelor pad. They're all hanging out. They're gaining weight. They're resting. They're getting prepared for the breeding season. Just a week ago, when I left Sabukok, he still was maintaining rut behaviors and displaying and singing and trying to attract the females for breeding. And it's clearly out of sync with what his wild counterparts are doing. <laughs> heads back to California, with an important task ahead of her. Somehow, she must switch Sibukak's sexually active period from summer to winter to match the sexual peak of his female companions. <laughs> Walrus's behavior in the Arctic is set by the day length. Summer is the time for rest and relaxation. Winter, migrating and mating. But Sibukak is on Californian time. He's never experienced anything like the Arctic. So his rut happens in the spring and summer rather than the autumn and winter. As a result, he, Siku and Okok are completely out of sync, like ships passing in the night. Hey, bud. Let's go on. Holly must somehow match what is happening in the wild. So first begins to fatten him up. Time for the weigh-in. But how do you weigh a walrus? With a set of scales, of course. Extra large scales. I it would appear Sibukak is a little bashful about his bulk. Over the next four months, they must increase Sibukak's weight to around 1,600 kilograms, about the weight of a small family car. Sibukak is 24, 25, and he's up 33 pounds. Yeah, there's still a very long way to go. Between meals, Sibukak gets a special treat. And an opportunity to show off another of his many talents. His suction is so strong, he makes easy work of turning a 10-kilogram block of ice into a cool, refreshing drink. Wallace has used suction to feed. The tongue acts like a piston, first pushed forward to the front of the mouth and then quickly withdrawn, creating a vacuum. It's been said walruses can create enough suction to suck the skin off a seal. But Sibukak's friends at the park needn't worry, he'd much rather eat fish. Surrounding those powerful lips are the walrus's most characteristic feature, their moustache. Called vabrisse, they form a broad mat of up to 700 stiff bristles. Highly sensitive feelers capable of detecting food beneath the silty sea bottom. Walruses are really oral animals. It makes sense, because out in the wild they're foraging for their food on the bottom and feeling for clams and different things. Here we don't obviously have foraging for them. 
So when we give them their fish and their clams to eat, they still enjoy foraging, so to speak. And so what uh, Savukok's doing right now is he keeps a little bit of fish from the last bit that we feed him, and he's essentially playing with it. Everybody thinks it's disgusting. <laughs> it's really gross. But again, you know, it's a, a natural behavior that they, they do. It's, uh, it's obviously an important part of their life. And um, if it's fun for him, then that's our problem to deal with. <laughs> Simukak is now getting through 30 kilograms of fish every day. Gorging like this prepares him physically for the rut, which lasts about three months. But during that time, he will drastically lose his appetite, so the food he eats now will need to see him through. With his weight rapidly increasing, Holly can start the next stage of his treatment. Every week, Savukat gets an injection of HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. This is a precursor to testosterone so that his body can make natural testosterone. Um, so right now, Jessa is getting ready to give him the injection. She's going to prep his back. It's just got to go. This is exactly the same medication that is used in human fertility treatments. Boosting his testosterone should artificially induce his rut and hopefully get him in sync with the girls. <laughs> but it takes two to tango, and Siku and Ukok must also be ready at the right time. They only have a narrow window during which they can conceive, a matter of days, okay. so timing okay. will be everything. Okay. Holly runs regular checks to monitor how they're doing. Okay. I'm ready. All right, Siku, open. Hold it. Oh, good. So one of the things we can do is... We take a simple swab of the inside of their mouth and around their tongue. Good. Good girl. We usually get a couple of swabs full. And this can be used to test hormone levels. Really? Science is boring? OK. Good girl. Although still warm in California, things are beginning to cool down in the Arctic. The nights are now much longer than the days, and this change of season is triggering the start of the rut in the wild. So to discover more about what happens next in wild walruses, Holly heads back out to Alaska. Having spent the last six months apart, the males and females are gradually coming back together. The males have left their summer haul out and swim north, while the females are floating south on the sea ice. Many will meet in the southern Bering Sea, around St. Lawrence, which has been nicknamed the walrus capital of the world. This is the island where Subukak, Siku and Ukuk were rescued as orphans all those years ago, the place where it all began. Welcome to Savunga. Thank you. Thank you. During the Cold War, St. Lawrence Island was strategically important to the U.S. and home to a large military base. Now this island community survives by hunting and harvesting what they can from the sea. Polly is here to find out more about the walrus's unique rutting behavior. But conditions are not looking good. Local people have told me that normally this time of year there is ice out here, but this year there's no ice. 
Because the ice retreated so far north this summer, it takes longer to come back. The sea ice conditions can change quickly in the Bering Sea, so Holly has to be patient and hope that a shift in the wind direction will bring the ice sheets and the walruses closer to land. The stormy seas may not be ideal for walrus watching, but they are washing up a bumper harvest for the villagers, including a bizarre animal that resembles a fruit. This is a sea peach, and they have found these in walrus stomachs before. The native people, one of their favorite meals is to cook the sea peach alongside the walrus meat. It's a, it's a very special delicacy. Wow. Yeah. Can you tell me about the, all of this wonderful food? Oh, these are walrus food. This is what the, the walrus is eat, the uh, clams. That's a big clam. We slice them up when you eat them. Here's a, here's a good one. If you want to taste it, it's pretty good. All right, here goes. I'm eating real walrus food. I'm watching. Uh-huh, it's real good. It is good. Uh-huh. Wow. Still no sign of any walruses. But if they're not here, then where are they? Female walruses and their young are normally spread out over thousands of square miles of sea ice. Over recent years, the Arctic ice has been reducing, forcing them to haul out on exposed beaches instead. And that can have dire consequences. In 2011, one of the largest walrus gatherings in living memory occurred at Point Lay, Alaska. Numbering nearly 20,000, this haul-out accounted for almost a tenth of the entire Pacific walrus population. Far from safety in numbers, these mass haul-outs result in the rapid spread of disease. But most worrying of all were reports of hundreds of walruses trampled to death during stampedes. And wherever walruses come on land, they are vulnerable to attack by the Arctic's most fearsome predator. An adult walrus can weigh twice as much as a polar bear. It seems a daunting challenge, even for the world's largest land carnival. The mothers put up a wall of hide and blubber to protect their calves. By rushing in, the bear spreads panic. In the chaos, some get separated. The bear spots an opportunity, but must avoid injury. Stabbing tusks could easily puncture a bear's skull. But in this case, the walrus hide, which can be nearly 10 centimeters thick, proves to be its greatest defense. The bear loses its grip and its chance of a big meal.
On St. Lawrence, the sea ice and the walrus still show no sign of arriving. So, Holly takes this opportunity to visit some of the villagers. And all of these pieces here are fossilized. Mm -hmm. These are fossilized. That's Joseph Akea is a fisherman fossilized. and a hunter. Even he also dives in these freezing waters to collect fossilized walrus uh, remains. Someone has um, cut into it. Yeah, by hand, probably. This was found on inland somewhere. Wow. So, you see the walruses all year round, somewhere. Somewhere the on the island, always, there's, there's walruses somewhere. They're, they're not going to be in one place. They're going to be moving, along with the wind, maybe, along with the current or the food. Right. You say you go diving out uh -huh. here in this water. Uh -huh. And you um, have heard walruses? I've heard walruses. They, they, they make some kind of a whistling sound, like, kunk. And then after a while, like maybe from their teeth or tusks, maybe mm -hmm. but it's like enough. hammering something. The sounds Joseph describes are very similar to those that Sibukak makes, and village elder Larry Carver has also heard sounds and seen intimate walrus behavior not recorded by science. They're amazing to watch when they're, uh, they want to mate. The bulls will be in the water, and all the females would be up on the ice. And after a while, the bulls would shoot up, up in the air, almost full length. Wow. People. They make real good sound, like whistling and ding. Beautiful sound. It's time for Holly to leave. She hasn't seen a single walrus, but is still taking something home from this remote and extraordinary place. The importance of walrus song to their courtship has been confirmed by the Yupik hunters, and Holly will be listening to the calls of her Californian walruses with renewed interest. As the Arctic winter approaches, the mating season begins, and the walrus song will peak. Perhaps sound could be the key to success. Back at the park, Sibukak's hormone treatment is making him increasingly vocal, just like the walruses in the wild. Sibukak's mood is extremely grumpy, irritable. I'm going to be keeping my distance from him because he's very unpredictable right now. He is in, he's in the peak of his rut. In the wild, this is a very typical normal rut behavior. What we have to do during these few months when he's just grumpy and irritable and cranky and unpredictable it's just giving him his space, giving him his distance, and um, wait him out. Well, the Sibukak can certainly knock out a tune. Scientists are just beginning to realize that the richness and complexity of walrus songs could rival that of whales. Now having heard it from the Yupik hunters, Polly knows that getting him singing at the right time could be vital to them breeding. Sibukak has long been something of a drama queen. He has over 75 different sounds, and often uses them to show off. In his younger days, Sibukak hit the heady heights of Hollywood. This began when Spielberg used his growl for the call of the T-Rex in Jurassic Park, and continued with other voice roles in Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and The Hobbit. 
not content with this bit part as a voiceover artist, he then stepped up to the plate, acting alongside Adam Sandler in Fifty First Dates. <laughs> now his unusual voice may just land him his biggest role yet. The romantic lead. Time for Holly and her team to take some sperm to see if six months of treatment has helped get him ready to sire some pups. Hold it, hold it. Good, so we have good. Easy. Good boy. Good. Good boy. Good boy. Keep going. Good. Good boy. Keep going. Easy. Okay. Simukak has just had his 18th birthday and should be in prime sexual health. But will he be at the peak of his sexual prowess? Well, the good news is we have plenty of sperm. So our um, efforts for making uh, Sabuka go into rut is, has been successful. And we have a really, really nice motility. That means the sperm is moving in a forward direction, and most of it is alive and looking really good. And this is what we want uh, for optimal fertility. So with our females coming into estrus, this is exactly what we want to see. So really good news here. Sibukak is physically ready, but now must be in full voice and at his most charming during Siku and Ukok's short breeding window. Holly has placed microphones around their pool to monitor their sounds. The sound that Sabukok is making right now is a rhythmic knocking sound. And if you look carefully at his head while he's knocking, you can see his head vibrating. And we don't understand exactly how um, he's producing those sounds. The other sound that he loves to make is a, he claps his flippers together. And there's a rhythm to the clapping. I don't have any rhythm. But he's very good at it. And sometimes he'll knock and he'll clap at the same time. It's a display that he does to make himself look big and strong. And you can feel the vibration through this very thick glass. It's very powerful. And now, he's inflating his throat sacs. These walruses have these enormous sacs in their necks that they can fill with air. And it makes a really interesting and almost beautiful sound when they fill it full of air. Now he's clapping and knocking at the same time. It's a remarkable thing to hear. You can imagine that in the wild, the males are sending out all of these sounds and they're traveling for miles, attracting the females. Sibukak is in full song. If Holly's work has been a success, then all she can do now is sit back and wait for the magic to happen.
What happens during walrus mating is one of the best kept secrets in the natural world. Until now. This is walrus love. It's not the most gentle thing you'll ever see, but when you're 3,000 and 2,000 pounds, you can handle it. This is the first time that this behavior has ever been filmed. In the wild, it happens in complete darkness, around the edge of the sea ice, in the frozen Bering Sea. In six years of studying these guys, I've never seen what we just witnessed. Okuk must be right at the peak of her estrus because she came over, solicited Sabukok, which we've seen before, but then they immediately started copulating right here in front of the window, and it lasted for at least five minutes. And the, the way they were together was remarkable. At last, Holly has seen them mating, proof that her treatments are working. And her microphones have revealed something new to science. Not only is Sibukak singing to the girls, it sounds like the girls are singing back. Siku, your voice was really impressive when you were singing your song, but Sibukak really seemed to like Ukuk, -uk, and hers is really, really different and interesting. So I don't know. What does it mean? This sound is Ukuk -uk calling. <laughs> Do you remember this? Do you remember making all those sounds? You were singing. This is Siku with a very different call. And this has never been documented before. And we have no idea if this takes place in the wild or if it doesn't, but um, this is really exciting information. So I don't know. What does it mean? Does it mean anything at all? What do you think? I sure wish you two could talk. But there's still a long way to go until she hears the pitter-patter of tiny fins. From conception to birth takes up to 16 months. Until recently, this was thought to be one of the longest pregnancies in the natural world. But research now suggests that female walruses delay implanting the fertilized egg into the womb for four months so that the calf is born in the spring when the weather conditions are best suited to its survival. In the wild, mothers and calves live in nursery groups well away from the large herds of big, clumsy males. The calves can swim within hours of birth, but at first rarely stray far from their mother's side, who protect them by holding them close. They stay together for up to three years, forging a bond that provides an opportunity to learn life's most important lessons, such as how to communicate, to share food, nurse one another's young, and to help other herd members when under attack. If either Siku or Ukok give birth, then Holly must be part of the nursery group, so she can keep a close eye on the health of the calf. So complete trust is essential, and she gains that by playing with them. Playtime with these girls is a very important bonding time. And this is going to be really good if we do end up with two pregnant walruses and two babies. We're going to want to be able to get close to these, these calves. We need them to trust us, to know that it's going to be okay if they share their calves with us. There's nothing more to do now except relax and wait for nature to take its course.
It's April. Winter has turned to spring, and the eggs should now be implanted into the womb. Holly is about to find out if six years of research has been a success. Right now, I'm checking uh, Siku's uterus. She actually has two uterine horns. I have to check both of them, the right and the left, to see if we see any fluids start to build up. This will be the first indication that we're on our way towards a pregnancy. This is all very new. There's no information out there to help us. There's nobody who has written a book that says this is what you should be looking for. So we're sort of writing the book as we go. Siku's very nosy. She always wants to know what's happening with her ultrasounds. Now in Siku today, I did see signs that she may have the very start to some uterine fluid. What do you think, Siku? You're not talking, are you? No. But right here, I have a bright white patch and a bright white patch that indicates that I could be looking at about two centimeters worth of fluid in her uterine horn. So if that's the case, then as I continue to watch this each week, it will grow and hopefully we'll see a baby in that left uterine horn. Siku looks great, and Ukuk looks great. They both are just perfect. One pregnant walrus would be a great result. Two would be extraordinary. Holly's work is providing invaluable insights into the breeding biology of these unique creatures. But best of all, it's helping a friend. I think Sabukak is going to become a dad this year. I feel confident. He's ready, and we're definitely ready to have that little bundle of joy walrus. From a four-month-old 70-kilogram orphan to an 18-year-old two-ton potential father. Now that is something to shout about. <laughs> Thank you.